start a, uh, a seminar series this is a, a monthly seminar series and I'm not sure who's who knows about it who's here for that here's just trying to grab a quick bite to eat for dinner but um, this is a scientific series and this week we're gonna be talking about climate change and why it's important to us and policy uh, that's, um, that's involved with that um, so my name is Ernest Timeseth. I'm one of the uh, I'm one of the leaders that's uh, organizing this event uh, it's called true talks borrowing from uh, the name of where we're at, True Delhi, but also from a uh, TED Talk, so here we are. Um, and so once a month, we uh, set up a, an, a, a scientific outreach series where we uh, pick a topic and pick someone who's a uh, who's, you know, specialist in their field on that topic and just, just have a discussion with, you know, uh, scientists, non-science people, if you're, if, if, you're, if you're not interested, if you don't, if you're not actively a scientist like some of us are, like I am, like our talk, um, that's okay. We hope that maybe we can get your uh, get your input and have a discussion on you know some some scientific topics that affect us all. Um, so first, uh, uh, True Talks. Uh, I should give a word to our, some of our sponsors. We're sponsored by the American Society for Cell Biology. Uh, it's an international uh, community of biologists that are interested in the cell, which is, um, you know, the fundamental unit of life. Um, and so we're dedicated to advancing science, scientific discovery and advocating uh, sound scientific policy, um, as well as increasing diversity in the scientific workforce, so something for us. Um, and a subcommittee of that is a, is a committee for uh, postdocs and students that represents young scientists uh, within AACB and strives to uh, uphold the principles of AACB and also uh, the participation of students and you know young scientists in their community. And so with that, we're we're actually supported by an outreach grant uh, awarded to us from them. So I'd like to just thank them. Um, and like I said, True Talks is it's it's an outreach event. And really, what what we want to stress is that basic research is important um, to our daily lives. It's important to our daily lives to world to the world around us. Uh, to our planet and, and to, the, to our future of all of this. And so what we strive to do is, is, uh, is to engage everybody, our community, on you know, some of these topics that affect us and looking forward into the future. Um, especially here where I imagine we're all at least 18 in this room. I, ho I hope so at least. Uh, because really, it's, it's what, where, are your tax, where are your tax dollars going when we say scientific research? Where are your tax dollars going, and who is it that are making those decisions? And what we hope is to shed some light on some of the some of the key issues that go into play that we hope you will think about when you think about electing your your government officials and how are they gonna how the decisions they're gonna make on your behalf. So we hope by the end of uh, this this event and future and past events that. Um, 
you'll get uh, an appreciation and learn something new, but also be informed on the importance of basic scientific research and uh, the, the impact of taxpayer-based scientific, scientific research. So I'm really excited today uh, to, to introduce our speaker, to have uh, Dr. Jason West uh, come and talk to us. Um, Jason is um, he's an associate professor at, here at UNC in the uh, Department of Environmental uh, Sciences and Engineering in the Gilling School of, of Global Public Health. Um, and it's interesting, actually, uh, he started off at Duke University. <laughs> so, what, so, don't worry, he's not a spy, and given the, the topic of his talk, uh, I think he's, he's working on everybody's behalf right now. So, <laughs> so um, but he got his PhD at Carnegie Mellon, and, uh, Carnegie Mellon, and um, his, 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 he's interested broadly in the relationship between air pollution, climate change, and how that influences environmental science and policy. Um, he uses computer models to uh, explore the effects of you know, changes in emission and uh, the health effects of, of air pollution um, and the effects of climate change on air quality. Um, he's, he's, he's a very decorated uh, 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 professor and his work has actually been published in pretty prestigious academic journals that have, that have also been um, that have also been featured in you know some some uh, pretty high uh, high end uh, news news outlets like uh, the Guardian, CBS News, and even National Geographic. Um, Dr. West was selected to be uh, NASA's Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences uh, team member uh, last year, and um, this uh, this team. Uh, uses uh, NASA satellites, uh, observations, and models of the Earth uh, to support decision making for air quality and health. Um, uh, Dr. West has presented his work, you know, all over the country, all over the world. He's gone to places like Brazil, uh, Singapore, Germany, Russia, China. You know, just so. Um, and uh, matter of fact, he's actually he's actually participated in a uh, United States congressional hearing to, uh, to talk about his work and his interest in the importance of air pollution, climate change, and, uh, uh, and how that affects our policy. Um, so I, I, hope, I hope you thank uh, uh, John me and giving him a warm welcome, and I'm looking forward to uh, Dr., uh, Dr. West's talk today, which is on climate change, what now? So thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation to be here. It's great to see so many people out on a rainy night. Um, so, climate change, you can hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Turn it up. Everybody in the back is... Yeah. Um, climate change is sort of a difficult issue to talk about sometimes. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of misperceptions about climate change out in the public. And what I'd like to do today is um, give you some of my understanding about what the issue is about how I got to the understanding that I have of climate change now. And the title kind of is a vague reference to the election, so we'll end up talking about what it means going forward for um, our society in the United States and for, for the world around us, too. Okay. Um, it's actually a good time to be talking about this from the point of view that the, uh, the March on Science just happened and Earth Day was on Saturday. This weekend is uh, the Climate March, and you'll be hearing about that in the news as well. Um, it will be happening in D.C., but there's, there's no climate march happening here in North Carolina, unfortunately. Um, anyways, I thought I'd start a picture with a picture of myself when I was the age of many of you. Um, I had the opportunity to, to study in Cambridge for a year, um, and it was an amazing opportunity. Um, you mentioned that I was at Duke, I studied environmental engineering, and thinking back, I mean, I'm not that old, but um, you know, there was a time when I barely remember any mention of climate change in my classes as an environmental engineer. That certainly changed through time, and it changed for me in the year I spent in England. So I just immersed myself in the topic, learned a lot, and really became amazed with this topic, not just because um, it was amazingly fascinating scientifically and, you know, um, in terms of impacts on society and what should policy responses be. All of those questions were amazing to me. But because, you know, in, in any conversation we have about climate change, we come back to what does this mean for the future of human civilization? 
education, right? Um, and um, what kind of society do we want for, for the future? So I'm going to share with you some of what I learned back then, um, in a way, and, uh, and, and we'll see where it takes us. So I'll start with what do we know really well. We know that greenhouse gases cause warming by absorbing infrared radiation. So heat given off by the Earth in the form of infrared radiation goes in the atmosphere. The atmosphere actually absorbs most of the heat that's given off by the Earth. Some of that's returned back to the surface of the Earth. That keeps the Earth warmer than it would otherwise be. We know very well that that, um, that that greenhouse effect, the natural greenhouse effect, is responsible for keeping the Earth 55 degrees warmer Fahrenheit than it would otherwise be. And we know that very well. This is a picture of John Tyndall, who at the time of the Civil War in the United States did the first, um, uh, conducted the first experiments to show that carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor are all greenhouse gases. And he was actually surprised to find that those were responsible for absorbing this heat in the atmosphere, but nitrogen, oxygen, argon, which he knew were not you know, which are together essentially 100% of the atmosphere. These things have nothing to do with uh, transmission of radiation through the atmosphere. Yeah. So is the heat that's being given up by the Earth from absorbed sunlight energy, or is it um, uh, heat from the core of the Earth? Where is yeah. it coming from? So um, we get energy from the sun, that's solar radiation coming in. The atmosphere is basically transparent to that, so most of that passes through reaches the surface of the Earth. Okay? The Earth is also giving off radiation, but it, the radiation that it gives off is in the infrared part of the spectrum, for those of you who, who know enough physics to understand these kinds, right? Um, I'm giving off heat, infrared radiation, the walls of this room are, the air in this room are, everything that has heat it gives off radiation. Okay, so the Earth does too, and so there must be a balance of what's come, between what's coming in and what goes out. Okay, but the the fact that there's greenhouse gases surrounding the Earth keeps more of that radiation closer to the Earth, in the same way that a blanket would, or a greenhouse would. And in fact, in Tyndall's time, the analogy of a greenhouse was was talked about as an analogy for how the atmosphere works. Okay, good question. Interrupt me with other questions if you have them. Okay. So we know that very well. We've actually studied that problem to death, I would say. Um, we also know greenhouse gas concentrations are increasing. These are observations from the Big Island of Hawaii, showing greenhouse, this is carbon dioxide concentration going up. We crossed for the first time uh, 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. And um, I'll be bold enough to say that um, it's unlikely to go back under 400 parts per million in my lifetime. And I'll sort of talk about that more later. Um, we also know that this is caused by human activities, right? Um, the Industrial Revolution started in 1850, and um, we know that um, the concentration of carbon dioxide now, this growth that's happened since 1850, we've never had carbon dioxide that high for at least the last million years, in fact, probably the last 50 million years, okay? I'm going through this quickly. Um, we also know temperatures are increasing. So this is the temperature record of the Earth from weather stations all around the world. So people study these temperature records, make their own judgments about you know, quality control, which data to keep in, which data to throw out. But what you see is the global temperature at the surface of the Earth increasing. Um, it's actually the magnitude of this increase is about uh, one degree Celsius or so which would be, let's call it um, one and a half or 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit um, since over the last century, with actually most of that rise happening in a few decades since 1980, right? Um, by the way, the last few years here, 2014 set a new global record, 2015 blew that record away, and 2016 blew that record away, okay? We know part of what's going on here is that the last couple of years was a very strong El Nino, year and then during El Nino years that, that's naturally heat is transferred basically from the tropical Pacific into the atmosphere. This is also a strong El Nino year. So that's one of the reasons that there's natural variability here, right, year to year. What's important to a climate scientist is just looking at this decade by decade that the Earth is getting warmer because climate is basically long-term weather. So we care about it on a decadal time scale. 
<laughs> so it's interesting because you could you could take a snapshot at any time relative to the year before and see and make an argument that oh it actually decreased. You know, but if you look at a law of large enough scale, it, the, the, the growing trend is actually an increase. Yeah, and that was a popular thing. Um, you know, uh, among crowns in Washington to pick 1990, pick 1998 as the start year and then draw a flat line through these years. And, and there was a slowdown here, and we like to understand scientifically what was going on there. We've got some ideas, but I don't know that we really know the cause of that. But it's really disingenuous to say, look, there's no global warming. One of the important point is that all of these years are, are higher in temperature than any of these years, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, go ahead. What happened in 1940? I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't know that that was the cause of it. Um, and in fact, you could argue that there was a slight cooling here. I have some ideas about what that would be, but I don't know that we've really explained that. But what's clear here, is the rise in temperature that's happened since 1980. Yeah. I don't want to play the devil's advocate, but sure. is there any correlation with the uh, volcano activity, which is also there based on you? So with this curve, if you, uh, you know, plot some of the activity of the volcanoes, if there is a peak, when there is more, uh, is there is So volcanoes have a natural cooling influence, um, and I have to give my guidance. These two years right here, that was Mount Pinatubo, which was the most powerful volcanic eruption of the 20th century. So Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted, and it caused these two years to be a little bit cooler, actually, uh, globally. Um, and it, this was seen all around the world, not just a few places. Um, but you see that it's not a huge change, and that was the biggest volcano of the whole century. So volcanoes are not what's driving the overall trend here. I, I know that, but yeah. I know that it might be affecting too. Yeah, so you can see it in the record. But, you know, you have to know what to look for. Yeah, good question. Yeah. I guess what, when you're looking at, at data like this, like information like this, is, is this compiled from, uh, um, from different locations throughout throughout the Earth and then average to this, uh, you know, to this temperature? Or? Exactly. Right. Okay. And okay. how you do that is pretty difficult because whereas we have a lot of weather stations here in the United States, there's less elsewhere, and especially fewer over oceans, right? And so that becomes a little bit more difficult. And then you have one station representing a larger area, basically. Um, but nonetheless, you know, you could do games of let's randomly throw out half the stations. You get basically the same result. Um, so we are actually have more weather stations than we need for the purpose of understanding global average temperature. Just a statistical If you change from the mean to the median, what would the purpose of I don't know offhand. Uh, I would have expected it to be the same. You've got cold places and warm places. I would expect the same trend. I've rarely ever seen a Gaussian distribution. Right. <laughs> okay. There's all kinds of other observations, and you guys have seen this in the press, of the world changing in ways that's consistent with the story that the world is getting warmer, right? So. Snow cover in the northern hemisphere decreasing. Um, sea ice on the on the Arctic decreasing actually pretty dramatically. This is the heat that's trapped in you know that's that's in the ocean basically, and we can measure this in three dimensions. But basically, it's going up, sea level going up. There's all kinds of records, and if we look at even biological indicators where um, birds migrate to when buds first come out on trees in spring. Um, the ranges of insects, all of these things are changing in a way that's consistent with this pattern of um, the, the world getting warmer. The IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so every few years it reviews the evidence on climate change and writes it up in a big document. This is the words that they used in the most recent assessment. The warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And many of you are scientists in this room, and you probably know that's a strong statement for a scientist. So scientists tend to hedge their bets and say, it's very likely that this is that, right? But this is a strong statement to say it's unequivocal. Okay. Um, so I said before that the rise in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases is clearly caused by human activities. It's a more difficult question, though, to ask the question, is the rise in temperature caused by human activities, right? Because you have to 
think about what are other possible causes of what's going on. So we have to confirm what's happening with the solar cycle, um, what's happening with volcanoes, as the question came before, um, to, to sort of throw out other hypotheses. And this is a very simple way that the IPCC used to communicate that. So this is the warming since 1950 observed. This is based on computer models, right, of the Earth system, what we would get from the warming of greenhouse gases, actually an overestimate of the observed warming. Humans also have a cooling influence on the Earth through basically air pollution, which is the other problem that I study. Um, so aerosols are particles suspended in the air that reflect sunlight back to space. That's a cooling influence. And we're increasing the amount of aerosols on the planet. So that's a cooling influence with a big uncertainty associated with it. But you add these up and you get this anthropogenic or human cause bar that matches pretty well with the observed bar. Okay? It's not, you know, the smoking gun, but there is good agreement there. Then when we look at the other causes, natural causes, we see that there's really no plausible explanation for why those things would cause warming. And so, again, the words of the IPCC very carefully chosen to communicate throughout the world. And in fact, when they came out with this, every major newspaper in the world would have run this quote. It is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the late 20s. Okay. Again, a strong statement for scientists, right? Um, I'd like to get toward what does it mean for the future and what can we do about it, right? Um, and, and, and I'm happy to sort of take more questions as we go, but I'd like to sort of then leave off with a discussion about, about those items. So using those same computer models, looking at the future, we don't know, you know, there's scientific uncertainty about how climate will change, but there's also, we also don't know what, how the world is going to evolve. So how many people there are there going to be? How much economic activity? How much energy are we going to use? What kind of energy resources are we going to have available? That all has bearing on what future emissions will be. So this is a high growth scenario, the red one, versus a very low growth scenario. And I'll show you in a minute what emissions correspond to these different scenarios. This high growth scenario, you could call this a case with no climate policy, would have by 2100, the world getting about four degrees Celsius warmer, that's about seven degrees Fahrenheit globally average. That's a big change, right? Geo in geologic time, um, you know, the ice ages were um, about five degrees Celsius, call it eight or nine degrees Fahrenheit, um, colder than we are now, and we know the world was a very different place, right, in, during the last ice age. This is then all human cars, all within a century. To me, that's striking. Um, and it was striking to me when I first started studying this stuff 20 years ago. Um, why do we care about it, though, from a human perspective, right? Beyond the world is changing, we need to think about it, what are the impacts of that? And there's a lot of different kinds of impacts. And this field of climate impacts is really growing. And one, one of the things that makes it really interesting is that obviously climate scientists are important for all of these different impacts, but then you would need to talk with economists and social scientists and people in medicine to really understand what those impacts mean to human civilization, in part because we can adapt to these changes. And so you see that there's a wide variety of different kinds of impacts that we would care about. And when the people that study this stuff, including myself, have come to the conclusion that none of these are not important. All of these are really important, right? Um, I'm just going to talk about health for a minute, since I'm in the School of Public Health at UNC. Just give you a couple of quotes. The, the Lancet is the big medical journal from, from Britain, and it did a big review on health and climate change. They said, and this is their words, tackling climate change could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century. Not curing cancer, not stopping AIDS, not uh, you know coming up with a cure for Zika or something like that, right? Um, climate change. Pretty striking. This is um, actually until this week our Surgeon General, who was just released at this post, um, but he said, you know, as we released a major review of climate change and health in the United States, these were his words, it's more challenging to public health than the polio epidemic, so this is a new kind of threat. What he's referring to is that climate change um, affects health in many different ways, through infectious diseases, through heat stress, through changes in air pollution, um, all kinds of different things that we're really um, poorly prepared to deal with right now. But together, with all of these different threats happening at the same time, he's saying that it's more challenging to deal with 
because we're not really prepared to deal with those many different effects. Okay. So again, a pretty strong statement. Good question. Yeah. Um, are there, this is not really playing devil's advocate either, but I'm sure. just curious, are there any uh, theoretical benefits of an increased temperature? There like could be. Better, I mean, it depends better on crop control or yeah. better rainfall in some places that don't get it? Or? Yeah, I mean, if you lived in Siberia, you, you would think it's a good thing, right? And, and that argument's been made. And, you know, there's, for example, um, CO2 fertilization. So CO2 is naturally a fertilizer for plants. And if you raise CO2, that increases the growth rate of plants, which could be good for global um, crops and agriculture. But um, you've got the competing influences then of CO2 going up while temperature is getting hotter water resources may become more scarce in the same places. Who knows what's going on with the nitro nitrogen cycle globally, right? And so, um, you know, all those things together make people think that over the long term, climate change is, meant, is probably going to be uh, detrimental to um, global agriculture, and certainly detrimental to global agriculture in developing countries where they're most food stressed today. Right? Good question. <laughs> um, I'll turn now to sort of thinking about energy and what are the solutions to the problem, right? Um, and one of the things that I think the public has a poor understanding of is the long lifetime of CO2 in the atmosphere. So of the CO2 we emit today, and we're emitting a lot of it today, um, how much of it will remain as a function of time into the future? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so we actually have a third of it still in the atmosphere 100 years from now. And it's got this long tail that CO2 persists in the atmosphere a long time. So um, it's a very long-term problem in a way that's unusual, right? If we think about political issues, how many of them have a time scale of 100 years and more? And that makes the problem really challenging. Not only is it global in scope, but it's very long-term, right? And that's challenging for us. So I showed you this picture before, um, and let's look at what are the emissions that correspond with these different temperature changes of these scenarios. So that's the rapid growth scenario, emissions tripling over the next century, right? And there's no reason to think that climate change would stop at 2100, but that, that's our tendency is to focus on that time period. Look what emissions would have to do to get to the blue curve. The blue curve doesn't make climate change go away. There is still some temperature change associated with that. Because of the long time of, lifetime of CO2, we're already, you know, there's baked into the system, you could say, warming from what's already in the atmosphere. You got me? Um, and so emissions have to decrease over the course of your and my lifetime. And by the time we're um, toward the end of the century, actually go to zero or negative. This scenario is thought to be really unrealistic. This scenario is thought to be achievable. Okay. What do we do about it? So energy is important, obviously. Um, energy is the big uh, source of emissions of CO2 from burning of fossil fuels. And this is just basic. Where do we get our global energy from? And it's surprising sort of how many people in our society don't have an understanding of this picture. Here's um, oil, coal, natural gas at the top. That's 80% of our global energy. Here's what's at the bottom here, nuclear, uh, hydro, nuclear, and other re renewables, including wind and solar. Right? Even in the United States, wind and solar, wind is the fastest growing energy resource we have in the US, but um, it's still a small fraction of the total. To address climate change and make this energy system carbon neutral, we need to, over our lifetimes, while right, global population is growing, while we hope people have better access to mobility and heat and computers and education and healthcare, all the things that we want for people all around the world, right? Um, we've got to transform this energy system so that we're providing all of those needs, but without the carbon that we have from the big three um, fossil fuel sources. That's a big challenge, but it's achievable within our lifetimes because we already know the technologies that can do it in a way. Yeah. I, um, I'm curious whether uh, those not like if you were to normalize like solar and uh, uh, right there wind and solar, which is uh, the light green one, uh, to like what well, is it just because it's a newer technology and relatively there's less of it? So if you were to come, if you were to like multiply by whatever factor, if we completely swapped how much oil and coal, because I'm just curious about like that. It's kind of increasing, so. How, how much would that would actually be an impact? Right. So the fastest relative growth rate, if you were to look at percent per year growth, is down here for sure, globally. 
Okay? But in terms of tons of emissions or in terms of energy used, this growth is still much less than the growth of that. Right? Um, so it's it's a uh, it's a maybe a bit of a paradox. But we've got a long time, a long way to go to make that um, you know um, um, become the dominant energy resource. Right? I don't mean to be political, but I will say, right, just focusing on this issue, um, we've now got the only. Um, uh, world leader of any of the 200 or so nations in, in the world that questions the scientific consensus on climate change. That's a, that's a pretty strong statement. Actually representing the only political party in, in the world that I'm aware of that also, major political party, that also questions scientific consensus. Um, so we live in you know pretty um, unusual times now. It's actually the case that 65% or so, the polls have been pretty consistent of Americans think that climate change, um, um, that humans have an important influence on climate change. The same 65% or 70% has said that um, we should um, take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and that we should carry through on our um, Paris uh, agreement pledges. Okay. So we actually have a majority of Americans. The percent of people in Congress that think that humans have an important influence on climate change, on the climate system, is about 50%. It's actually less than the American public as a whole. So we have um, sort of support to think about the issue, and I don't want to be to a totally a downer, so I'll leave you with a few reasons for hope, right? So as we talked about, wind and solar, the costs are coming down, that's making them cost competitive, um, and, and, and they can they are being players, they are transforming the energy system as we speak. The other big one has been fracking, which has made natural gas very cheap. Um, and so if natural gas is replacing coal, that's actually better, even though it's a fossil fuel, it's better from a climate point of view. You can see that actually in U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. So these are year by year U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. They actually peaked in 2007 and we've been coming down since. The growth of wind and growth of natural gas are the biggest um, um, reasons for that. So a reason to be optimistic. We've got um, changes in automotive technology, all kinds of um, technological changes that are taking place. And now we're talking about going to world with um, you know, driverless vehicles and all kinds of things. Businesses are getting behind this uh, climate change. These are a bunch of businesses that have signed up for a pledge where they said that tackling climate change is one of America's greatest economic opportunities of the 21st century. We've got the global energy system, which is actually 10% of the global economy that needs to be transformed. Do you think there's a business opportunity in doing so, right? If you're on the leading edge with some with some cool technologies that can make it work? Yeah, there's great opportunities there. Um, and actually a lot of companies have been um, very forthright, including companies like oil companies, saying that, um, writing to President Trump and saying we need um, to take action on this and um, you know tell us what the rules are and we'll make it happen. We can we can innovate and we can imagine a world without um, climate change. Um, the Pope has gotten behind it. His statement a couple years ago was really strong, where he said that um, climate change is a moral issue, um, that polluting and not taking care of our planet is a sin, um, and he said that. Um, What's important here in part is thinking about um, um, the global poor. And because climate change has the greatest impacts on the global poor who are the least able to deal with it, he said that these are not two problems but one. So taking care of the world's poor and taking care of our planet are in fact one issue that we need to think about in an integrated way. A very strong statement. Um, and there's the Paris Agreement from two years ago um, that, um, you know, um, was the biggest step humanity has taken to address this problem. Um, so, um, and even if the U.S. pulls out of it, which is possible now, um, there's a, a lot of agreement, um, there's a lot of momentum among the international community to act even without the United States. So, um, I've covered a lot of ground. Um, I think we've got a lot of important challenges in, as we think about climate change. Um, a lot of impacts of climate change, but also a communications challenge, and maybe I'll talk about that just briefly. 
we've sort of conceived of climate change as being something that happens to nature, not to people, something that happens globally, not here in the United States, and something that happens far in the future, not today, right? And in a way, that's wrong. And we need to sort of think about how do we change that message as we talk with people about it. So it's about people. It's about here in the United States. It's happening now, and it's happening all around us. So we need to sort of think about how to change that message. And you know, I'm not. A, I'm an engineer. I'm not a communications expert. So I can use some help and think about how to do that. All right. One last slide to wrap up. This is uh, a picture of my father. Is here. In 1945, 50 years before I went to England, he was also in England, um, flying it. My, my father was a B-17 pilot. Um, and so I, at the time that I went to England, thought a lot about what are the great challenges for my generation. And, you know, it was clear for my dad what the big challenge of his problem, of, of his age was. But for me, it was a lot harder to think about it. And I think that there's a lot of parallels in, in terms of, you know, this global challenge that we face with climate change. One thing that's different is, you know, my father fought the war and came back and that was over. Right? Um, but, you know, I know that climate change will continue to be an issue long after I'm dead. And that's one of the important differences. But one of the things that you would say is when you look at what's been called the greatest generation, right, is that these are people that did not back down from challenge, right? Um, and here we are sort of talking about um, debating the science on, on Capitol Hill even as we speak, 20, 20 years after I started studying this stuff. And, and, and that's kind of a shame, and I'd like to see how we can get past that. So I've given you a lot of food for thought, so I'd like to get your thoughts, comments, concerns. Thanks. <laughs> So there's this big pool of CO2 in the atmosphere, and it's clearly not in equilibrium. It's going up. It's being fed by natural sources and by human pollution, and it's being taken away by something. I assume plants are absorbing it or maybe dissolving in the ocean. I wonder if there's any part of a solution that people could imagine that would involve accelerating the removal of CO2 from yeah. the atmosphere. So where does the CO2 go to? It, um, it's taken up by plants. But in many cases, when the plants die, much of that carbon is re re returned to the atmosphere. And you know, we're deforesting faster than plants are growing. Anyways, um, the, uh, um, the, um, uh, the other place that it goes is it dissolves into oceans. Um, so it dissolves quickly into the surface ocean, but the surface ocean, the ocean stratified so that there's not a lot of mixing between the surface and what's deep. So it's that rate that the ocean turns over is one of the big things determining the time scale at which um, um, climate change happens. So there's some uncertainty around how quickly that happens. So, um, but you know, we don't have much ability to um, affect the rate at which the ocean turns over. Um, so, so your question was, could we speed up the, the taking? Is there a pie in the sky solution that people, you know, yeah. airplanes with big scoops that are pulling in CO2 and I don't know what. Is anybody yeah. thinking about that? People are, and um, some of the ideas have been um, fertilize the ocean so that phytoplankton grow more rapidly. That would take up more CO2, um, and that's been actually tied, tried and tied studies and it was very complicated but it didn't seem to have worked quite as people had hoped. People are studying the growth of algae and whether algae or other microorganisms could be used to accelerate CO2 take up. You know the, the simple the, the easiest way to think about it then is you know taking up um, by plants which are basically trees around the world. Um, first we've got to slow down deforestation before that happens but one thing we can imagine doing is if we have biofuels, you could think of ethanol, but just, you know, you can cut down trees and burn them in power plants. That's possible to do. If we could imagine doing that on a very large scale um, to produce electricity, displacing coal, then you could actually, we have technologies to capture CO2 that's emitted from power plants. You could do that. You could capture the, burn the trees, make electricity, capture the CO2, and stick it underground. Okay, that's one of the ways that we could actually think about removing CO2 from the atmosphere somewhat permanently. So we're basically taking it from underground from the petroleum That's stuff right. and putting it in the air. So putting it back underground seems, we don't have this magnitude of scale to do that, uh, or the geological time scale to do that, but it would be great if we could. Yeah, so for some perspective, when you burn fossil fuels to get um, carbon, and, and carbon dioxide is released, 
the amount of carbon dioxide that's released is by mass about three times the mass of the fossil fuel that we burned in the first place. So think about how big is our infrastructure for taking coal out of the ground, moving it from place to place, burning it. Um, same for oil, same for natural gas. We need an, an infrastructure that's basically that big, or even three times as big, to capture all of that CO2 and stick it in the ground. It's kind of mind-boggling to think about it. But you know, these changes happen to build the global energy infrastructure that we have today has happened mostly in the last 50 years, right? Within our within our lifetimes. So we could imagine building something like that over the course of the rest of our lifetimes, yeah. Yeah. In terms of the ocean. I uh, first snorkeled on Orient Bay in St. Martin about 1977. I went back in 2009 or so, and um, there was no development earlier uh, around the, the bay. And the coral was beautiful. Flame coral was really great. I just didn't want to rub up against it. And uh, when I went back, it was all dead. Uh, it's white coral uh, skeletons, and the same thing is happening to the Great Barrier Reef. It is, yeah. So, uh, warming of the ocean is extraordinarily detrimental to those poor little coral single cell organisms. Yeah, you're right. I mean, and if you care about corals, I mean, that's one of the great, you know, natural tragedies that's going on as we speak. Um, and they are very sensitive, as I understand. There's actually several um, uh, um, stresses that affect corals. It's understood that they, they are um, affected strongly by temperature, very temperature sensitive. But it's actually also um, carbon dioxide that's dissolved in ocean water that makes it slightly more acidic. Um, and that actually has an effect on corals and other marine life. Um, as we move ships around the world, that's carried diseases from place to place that affect corals. That's one of the things that's responsible for the downfall, as well as you know, um, water pollution, you could say. Um, so there's a bunch of stressors all interacting, and in any one place, it might be actually that some of those other stressors are the most important. But globally, it's clear that carbon dioxide and um, climate change is having an important influence. Yeah. Uh, you had a comment. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm a political scientist. So I'm a little, maybe as a result, I'm a little uh, pessimistic about the political process on this issue. And sometimes when I talk with people from the engineering, natural science background, they say, "Well, we'll we'll do geoengineering, put mirrors in the solar system, or launch a bunch of sulfur particles, and that'll reflect the energy." And so I wondered if you could speak to the, the opportunities and risks associated with that if the reduction side fails, the, yeah. the geoengineering kind of fallback option. Yeah, um, and there's interesting technologies being talked about, including, like you said, ways of reflecting sunlight back to space. Um, I talked about um, uh, volcanoes. The question was before, could we sort of mimic what a volcano would do? Um, you know, there's... Um, I think we have reason to invest in researching these options. I think we have as well sort of a high bar of let's test these out very carefully before we try them um, because we're affecting the whole world all at once. You're a political scientist, so how do you think about global governance and global decision making about something that affects everybody? Um, that's a tough question. But you know, scientifically, yeah, there's reason to think that some of these things might work and actually might be somewhat cheap. But you know, the other part of it, though, is carbon dioxide is going up and going up exponentially. Um, and, and you saw how temperature would rise through time. We'd need increasingly more and more and more of this kind of thing to offset the human-caused warming. Could it be part of a solution? Sure. Yeah, you have a question? You, you said you're an engineer, not like a com communicator, but I was wondering, <laughs> do you have any suggestions on how to like, you know, make this more tangible to normal people? Um, yeah, maybe, um, you know, maybe you took something from my talk, right? Um, but, um, you know, there's a lot to the science. The science is complicated, I understand that. But what's so complicated about um, the Earth's warming, um, humans are responsible, energy is the driver, we have technologies to solve it. That's not so hard to say, right? The whole thing is getting people to sort of understand and believe that point, right? Um, 
The other thing that can help are sort of analogies, and you hear these kinds of things. So 97% of scientists think that climate change is affected by humans. Um, activity. So if you were to board a plane and 97% of the engineers said it's unsafe to fly in, would you get <laughs> Or if you went to your doctor and your doctor said, um, you know, you're likely, you've got really high cholesterol, you really ought to exercise more and change your diet. Um, are you going to criticize that doctor um, and, and say, well, you, you, you can't tell me exactly when I'm going to die, so I'm not going to do those things. Or are you going to take the prudent action? We all know what, what the right thing to do is in, in that case. Is. And actually, you know, it's, it's, it's probably more likely that your doctor is getting, um, you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but it's probably more likely that your, your, your doctor is getting some kickback from the um, pharmaceutical industry and that the climate scientist, you know, has no, nothing to gain from this, um, is, 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 you know, cooking the, cooking the numbers. So, anyways, analogies can maybe help. Um, but yeah, for me, it's a work in progress. How do you talk about this with public audiences, right? Good question. Um, yeah. A lot of time when I'm talking to someone, especially engineers, as a matter of fact, in terms of uh, solutions. Uh, I'm often challenged on renewables' ability to replicate what coal and oil and gas and nuclear even is delivering in terms of economic output. Can you comment to to how feasible really it is, or how fast yeah. you can look um, to renewables in terms of maintaining you know, the economies? that we have now? Well, there's certainly a challenge of making it happen fast, but with enough money behind it, that's possible. One of the one of the big technical challenges, though, is the intermittency. So you get wind when it's windy and sun when the sun's shining. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of interest now in energy storage technologies, and could we be developing those? Um, and so, you know, one of the companies out in front on that is, is Tesla Motors, who is developing new batteries for their cars. Could some of that be used to help store energy on the, on the grid? And there's all kinds of different ideas. Using water, uh, there's something called um, compressed air underground storage. You use underground caverns, force air down into it. Then, um, what, then when you want the energy back, you release it and it drives a turbine to generate electricity again. So there's all kinds of ideas like that. Um, some of these are in different stages of development. Does that have to be there before renewables can take? We could get renewables to a bigger percentage than we've got now without big changes, but could it become 50% of the whole thing? Um, no, that's tougher. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So 150 years ago, nobody probably would, maybe except Adam Smith, would have predicted the problems that we're having now with right. CO2. So I'm just wondering, are there problems with capturing wind energy? Like if we had so many... Um, wind energy capturing devices that would change the flow of air on the surface of the Earth? So a hundred years from now, is that going to be a huge problem? Um, I'd say probably no. The people who um, study birds and are interested in birds are really worried about a, a rapid growth of wind energy. You know, I don't know whether those claims are, um, um, you know, overstated or not, but... Um, um, I'm, I'm not thinking so much about birds, but about climate. Could it yeah, change the climate if no, it changed I, the flow I, I, of air? I mean, I'd be skeptical with that. Yeah, it could slow down wind speeds. That would be the effect. And locally, it, it could have an effect um, on, on sort of regional weather or something like that. But the long-term problem, the long-term solution is not likely to be wind. Why? Because there's not enough energy in wind globally to solve everything. The, the long-term solution is likely to be solar, and I'll tell you why. The amount of energy that the Earth receives from the sun all the time is 10,000 times the total amount of energy that humans use for everything. So we only have to get, what is it, one hundredth of one percent of the energy coming from the sun converting into electricity to power everything. So there's a huge amount of energy in solar. It, it, the problem is that the costs of solar are still higher than that of wind. Okay. Um, but they're coming down quickly. Um, and there's a lot of new ideas being um, tested and developed even here at UNC. We have a, a solar energy lab. Is that just because it's a newer technology and just developing Yeah, we're just not there yet. Yeah. Um, cost came down a lot, actually, as manufacturing shifted over to Chinese. And Chinese now dominate the solar energy development market because they can manufacture it cheaply. But there's new ideas and entirely new ways to go about 
um, capturing energy from the sun chemically right, within solar panels that could, you know, they, one of those ideas could very well be a breakthrough and, you know, change the game. This is not a question, it's just a, a general comment. I think one problem that we have with uh, climate change is that people don't assume we are part of the world. We think it's the government, we think it's society, we think it's the world, right. but we are not able to make an effort. And uh, so if you show this here about the, uh, you know, the worst scenario, and the one, one solution would be to decrease our economic growth. So to reduce our life studies, not using air coal, not using heating or having or next step, easier, even easier, having better uh, buildings. Yeah, you can see you have the buildings that in, in winter, it's too hot. In summer, you're, you're super freezing. So we're wasting a lot of energy. You can sometimes there are people uh, doing heating at the same time that air conditioning is on because you can, it's a general. So if you're not doing anything about it, we don't even build a uh, you know, public transportation network. And that is one or two lines of train. Right? So you have to use car everywhere to go anywhere. So, but nobody, nobody really speaks about that. I'm not saying this administration, not even the previous one, was yeah. supposed to be good. So. Yeah, it's a great comment. Um, and how do you increase awareness of energy when energy is basically, we use it all the time, but it's kind of invisible to us, right? And, and that's a big challenge. And so, um, you know, as an educator, I think, you know, how can we be doing a better job of that? And, um, yeah, it's a big challenge. Great question, great comment. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, to, to kind of build off that, I was thinking the same, you know, similar thing, it's just, um, a lot of these things are they're they're already abstract concepts, but it's all abstract. You know, making those connections versus you know, hey, I I leave I leave my trash out tomorrow. It goes away somewhere. I don't care where. It's just not here anymore. And but how that on a larger scale affects me. You know, so like I guess one one example is just uh, you can see a lot of celebrities that that. Um, don't you don't hear about them about caring about this or that disease until it's, it affects them personally? All of a sudden, everybody becomes an advocate. Yeah. Um, so, same thing like everyday people. It's just like no one really cares about some wars in foreign land until it starts affecting gas prices or things like that. You know, milk, bread, whatever. Um, and so, part of the challenge that I see is just like how do you how do you make those problems very real? For people, besides some abstract concept, yeah. you know, the hey, this is going to affect my, this is going to affect my breathing, my health. Yeah, you get diagnosed with diabetes, but that's like 10, 15, 20 years from now. If you don't do something about it, you know, like the, the doctor thing you said is just like it's not an immediate thing. And I guess I'm, I, I don't have the answer for that either. I'm just you know, trying to throw that out. It's like, how do we, how do we make it that real for people to care about it that much? Yeah, I think that's our challenge. Is probably, you had a comment. You do have a <clears throat> real federal government agency that is interested in sea level rise. It's called the U.S. Navy, and uh, maybe South Beach, and Miami would be interested. And I know Vienna, uh, Venice uh, has adapted to the reverse flow of high tides and the piazza um, uh, there. So the Navy is well aware that uh, a couple of uh, you know, a major rise in sea level will inundate the military bases. And uh, so I think we do have a, I don't know if they'll ever speak out, but there is an ally there. Yeah. It, it, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the military strongly believes climate change is an important problem, and the other reason why they care about it is destabilizations of societies as people, you know, lose access to food and water, and then what do they do? Um, and, and there's a lot of suggestions that that's been going on in Africa now for a few decades in parts of Africa. Um, and a lot, potentially, that the military worries about in that regard. Um, you had said, um, about, you had talked about um, mentioning solid waste and, you know, how many people are recycling now? And, um, that's really a big environmental success story, isn't it? A public awareness success story. And that took place, you know, from the time that I was in college to now. Um, so, it, you know, it's easy to see that because you're holding the trash in your hand. Um, I mean, you do flip on the light switch yourself, and it's, but, but energy has this, you know, it's a little bit harder to communicate energy and why it's important, just because 
it's a little bit less tangible, I think, than trash is. But, you know, that, that's something we can look to for what were the things that, you know, again, I'm not a communications expert, what caused the change in people's thinking about recycling. So the ozone hole was a big problem, right? And that, that got solved, but yeah. it's also like kind of farther away, like not as, even like as recycling, right? And what do you, do you think that there's something that you can that solution to what? Um, yeah, I mean the ozone hole, you're right. It was the Montreal Protocol that was signed to solve that problem. And basically it's gonna take another few decades for the ozone hole to recover, but so we've taken all the appropriate actions for that to happen. Okay. So that's a great success story, in, in case you're wondering. Um, it was, uh, if I remember right, Kofi Annan, who said that the Montreal Protocol was the single greatest, um, single most successful um, international agreement, period, of any international agreement, because it, it, achieves, it achieved its objectives and got global buying. Amazing, right? Um, so that's certainly a case that we can look to. That was a lot easier than climate change in the sense that we just had to convince governments to weigh on their chemical industry to stop producing this stuff. It was one source. It, the same industry all around the world. And, and it happened. Um, and there was a replacement gases for it. Those replacements, by the way, were um, strongly global warming gases, even though they didn't include the ozone wall. We've now gone through another revision of um, you know, global agreements to replace those replacement glasses with ones that are better for climate now. Um, interesting, I know. Um, so, uh, yeah, but that's looked at among political scientists as a success story and can be learned from that. Good yeah. comment. Um, how are we doing on time? Uh, should we take the one? Or? Yeah, we're good. <laughs> so, so uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming up here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, we'll suggest it. Okay. 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 Okay.